Good morning, my Freunde, and welcome to the second instalment of our Guerrilla Assault on 60 or so years of my local Top 40, where we appreciate the great and denigrate the unfortunate. This week we swoop down on the 4BC Top 40 for the week ending January 10th, 1965. Opening the countdown is the first of two entries this week for the Rolling Stones. They also had a third outside the Top 10 their impeccable cover of Irma Thomas's Time Is On My Side, which is down this week from number 8, having peaked at number 4. The Stones cut two versions of this song, the earlier version, which was the hit in Australia, which is looser and has a simple organ intro, and a later more famous version, which was released on the album 12 by 5 and seems to be the version played on the radio today. Indisputably one of the records that came to define the Stones' early sound and one of their earliest bona fide classics, the song is still popular today and regularly turns up on compilation albums of the Brian Jones era Stones' output. Number 9 entering the top 10 from number 11 the previous week is Gene Pitney's I'm Gonna Be Strong. Pitney was at the peak of his career here and this is typical of the strong, confident and professional approach to both his gathering material and his singing it. In this case, Pitney returned to Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel, one of the supreme songwriting teams of the 1960s. They wrote, You've lost that loving feeling, we gotta get out of this place, remember walking in the rain, amongst dozens of others. One curious thing about Gene Pitney, and, and for that matter Roy Orbison, was that even as their careers dipped in their native USA, they never stopped having hits on my local charts. We were always sending these guys into the top 10 with singles that bombed everywhere else, right up to the late 70s. At number eight, one of the greatest records of the 1960s and a shining jewel in the crown of Motown, The Supremes with Come See About Me, the third of five straight US number ones the band enjoyed in 1964-65. Written by the unbeatable team of Brian Holland, Lamont Dozier and Eddie Holland, who wrote 10 at number ones for the Supremes alone, Come See About Me is perhaps the best of them. Irresistibly tuneful, performed with that bouncy Motown strut by the immortal Funk Brothers, and teasing the most winning vocal out of Diana Ross. Come See About Me is everything that is good and represents everything that is timeless about 60s pop. Number seven is another of the high summer hits, a little bit of hyper jangly proto folk rock from the second Liverpool band to break through in the USA, The Searchers, with their version of Jackie DeShannon's When You Walk in the Room. It's not as good at par se as DeShannon's, but it has a stripped down drive to it that her wall of sound version lacks and gives it a life and charm of its own and, like Come See About Me, is the perfect type of car radio hit that the long summer called out for. Having been in the top 40 for four months already, When You Walk In The Room was at the end of its chart run, dropping down from number four the week before and to number 16 the next week. The superbly named Shangri-Las were at number six this week, down from number two the week before and hurtling down to number 27 the next, with their widescreen melodrama, The Leader Of The Pack. One of the most irresistibly silly records ever made, it succeeds brilliantly because of the seriousness with which it is always taken, both in the performances of the Lars, but also in the meticulous backing track assembled. Billy Joel says that this was one of the first jobs he ever had in music, was playing on the demos for this record, but he's mistaken, it was their previous single, Walking in the Sand, that Joel played on. The girls themselves were just teenagers, the youngest 15, the oldest 17, from the same rough neighbourhood that gave us the Ramones. And they had quite a few great hits, but this is the one they were remembered for. And what a thing to be remembered for. Some fun and funky facts before we hit the top five. The biggest climber this week was Saturday Night at the Movies by the legendary 
in name only by this point in time, Drifters, which rose 15 spots from number 30 to number 15. It was written by our good friends Barry Mann and Cynthia Wheel. The biggest plummet was the William Tell Overture by Sounds Incorporated, who fell seven places to number 32. Former number ones tumbling out of the charts included Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs' Hard Rockin' Sick and Tired and the hillbilly cat himself, Old Elvis, with Ain't That a Love on You Baby. New to the charts this week were the Animals with Boom Boom and the Rolling Stones made it three in the top 40 with Around and Around. One of the thorniest questions in looking at the classic canon is what do you do with great records made by demonstrably egregious individuals? Taking me for example, I'm a glam rock tragic and I grew up on a box of Gary Glitter singles. So, it turns out Glitter is an irredeemably wicked pervert. Should I be uncomfortable in enjoying the basis on which he built the power to indulge his monstrous appetite so widely? The corollary is also true. What do you do about awful records that were made by genuinely decent people who retain their humility and humanity in the face of fame? Because Bobby Vinton, who's at number five this week with Mr. Lonely, was just that. Pretty much C-level talent who seemed to sing songs the major pop singers would have been too embarrassed to touch. Although it may be said he had an awful lot of hits over an awful long time. He's the kind of guy who gets more impressive the more you research him. He seems genuinely cool and grateful for the success he achieved. I guess we're here to talk about his records though, and the circumstances under which they got made, in which case Vinton was solid bank for his record company, but he was here a man increasingly out of times, as rock and roll started to evolve into rock music. Number four was the ill-starred Del Shannon, whose Keep Searching continued an inexorable march up the charts. Four weeks in and up from number six, this mysterious garage rocker with an urgent sound typified Shannon's excellent songwriting and his powerful voice. Shannon was most famous, of course, as the first US artist to record a Lennon McCartney song with his cover of From Me To You in 1963. Spoiler alert, Keep Searching hit the local number one spot the very next week. Number three, the theme of summery pop slammers continued with Cliff and the Shadows and the twist-tastic closest thing the British had to surf music, On the Beach. The great Hank Marvin is in attendance with his customary twangy guitar solo. Cliff packs a song with energy and charm and how he didn't become a superstar in the US is beyond any reasoning. The song comes from a movie, Wonderful Life, and it'll come to no shock to anyone that Cliff is a much better and a much more natural actor than Elvis was. After a mere week at number one, the Beatles find themselves, after five weeks on the charts, slipping down to number two with I Feel Fine. A song that bears a marked resemblance to Bobby Parker's R&B hit Watch Your Step, the double guitars, feedback openings spliced on by George Martin, Ringo playing with a lighter touch than usual, perhaps trying to give the song the same drive as What'd I Say by Ray Charles, and Lennon's strident vocal over a sweeter middle eight. The band must have known they had a number one long before the nine takes it took to make it were done. And now... Number one. Up from number three after five weeks on the charts and due for a huge drop the next week to number nine, it's Little Red Rooster by the Rolling Stones. I've got to say, given the generally up-tempo summery pop vibe of the chart this week, I find this authentic blues song to be a real outlier. I mean, it's a superbly made record. It has genuine atmosphere and a real hook with Brian Jones' slide guitar part, but it just doesn't scream zeitgeist to me. But again, I'm probably discounting the fact that even sleepy oversized country towns are not immune from the seismic shifts that were occurring in music at the time as the divide between pop, rock and roll and rock were beginning to open and given one of the defining points of demarcation between rock and roll and rock music is the increasing influence of the blues, perhaps this is a bellwether. And the Rolling Stones, say it softly, were the greatest blues band in the world in 1965. 
there we have it a top 10 with nine great records and one schlocky one from a popular artist who just kept on believing in his talent and his fans the biggest disappointment of course is no local acts in the top 10 there were four in the top 40 two from local boy billy thorpe one each from ray columbus and the invaders who strictly speaking were uh, new zealanders and perth's sound incorporated but what great records they all were despite the summary feel how musically diverse it wasn't hard to tell that the top 40 was on the verge of enormous changes over the coming year the super secret scoring algorithm rates this week at a whopping 7.1 out of 10. All that remains is to thank you for dropping by. Feel free to comment, like or subscribe and I'll be back next week with another survey of the past as a foreign country.